Okay, so I'm going to appoint Rebecca as the host as well. Now, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to our guest speaker this afternoon, Rebecca Samuels. Rebecca is a final year undergraduate student of classical studies at the Open University. She actively spends time on site at many of the Roman sites in the north of England, so we're delighted that we have her here this afternoon to talk to us. Her main focus of study has been in Roman literature, with a focus particularly on graffiti and handwriting, which is really rather interesting. Not only that, but Rebecca's independent research has led to the creation of a Roman handwritten typeface, which is called Roman Cursive Font, the Roman Cursive Font Project, okay, also known as Amo Scribere, and this is available to purchase online. So a super impressive guest that we have here this afternoon. We're delighted to have her. So without further delay, I'll pass you over to our speaker as she presents her paper on how ancient Roman graffiti proves people have hardly changed in 2000 years. So thank you and welcome to Rebecca. Thank you very much, Kerry. And thank you everyone for choosing to come and listen to me talk. So, the main interest that I've got with um, Roman graffiti is the fact that it's one of the few types of written evidence we have that is across the empire. So we can find it everywhere from Vindolanda to um, Africa, which is really exciting obviously um this is the article abstract so i'll just i'll quickly read through this and then we'll get going so the article offers a general discussion of ancient roman war writings in comparison with those of the modern day using both ancient sources and modern scholarship it defines graffiti as intrinsically human offering a unique insight into the romans during their least guarded moments the wealth of formal written sources left by the Romans suffer from many curtailing factors in their usefulness, such as the lack of diversity in their authorship and the socio-political biases they represent. In response, this article aims to advocate the theory that Romans from all walks of life were represented in graffiti, and to celebrate the tireless research of countless generations of archaeologists scholars, which was begun by the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum in 1857, and is continued today by Benefiel, Rebecca Benefiel, and the Ancient Graffiti Project. The article goes on to briefly discuss handwriting styles present in such pieces in line with my independent research into Roman cursive handwriting and my subsequent creation of a Roman cursive typeface which I will go into a little bit more later. Yep, so paleography is the study of historic writing systems. So paleos, old graphene to write. Although monuments and book scrolls were written in upper case um, in order to make them as accessible as possible to as many people as possible, the writing of everyday life would have been in a minuscule cursive form, which we still see today across the empire, evident particularly in graffiti. So graffiti is mainly interesting, um, particularly to archaeologists, because simultaneously it's a script and an artifact a text and an act so you, it's difficult to separate the act of writing with graffiti from the text that's written which makes it um one of few very few remnants of the ancient world which preserves the material context of their creation their production as such it's very difficult to categorise graffiti within disciplinary boundaries, 
which adds to its interest for archaeologists. Um, disciplinary boundaries that we typically have are ancient history, philology, art history and archaeology. So a difficulty of defining graffiti within that is that there's no methodical use of the term within these disciplines. Graffiti can be used to describe items as varied and disparate as trademarks, dedications, drawings of gladiators, etc. The most interesting aspect of Roman graffiti for the purposes of this presentation is their use in paleography. Um, obviously the study of ancient writing systems. And I could not resist the urge, I am sorry, ladies and gentlemen, to reference the comedic virtuosity of Monty Python's Life of Brian, in which the inimitable, the wondrous John Cleese and Graham Chapman revisit their schoolboy Latin lessons as Cleese is Apologies, we seem to have lost Rebecca. Um, I will just see if we can get her back. If you bear with me for a second, guys. Okay. Hopefully she should be joining us again in a few minutes. The wonders of technology. Okay. We're just waiting for our guest speaker to hopefully come back to us. Anybody wants to take this opportunity? Oh, Rebecca's back. Excellent. I was just about to say if anybody needs a glass of water or anything. Okay. No. Sorry, everyone. I am deeply apologetic for this. It happens, um, it happens to the best of us, Rebecca. I'll just yeah. pop you back to host duties now. Thank you. Um, can I just check where I got up to? Uh, you were just talking about Monty Python. And yes. That, that's where we were. Fantastic. So I will just bring up the presentation again. Okay. It always and then that. Get it's back to it. It's done it a few times for me too, Rebecca, during teaching. <laughs> so I, I know what you, you, you're going through. <laughs> yeah. So if we just... There we go. Right, so um, yes, Life of Brian. Um, John Cleese, the centurion who corrects poor, hapless Brian Chapman as Brian for his precious uh, grammar before commanding him to write all of the uh, corrected form of, sorry, 
<laughs> before um, instructing him to copy out the corrected form of Romanes Aunt Donos on the walls of Jerusalem 100 times before dawn. So life of Brian confirms to us that it's human nature to make comparisons and to draw parallels between the ancient and the modern. And it's this interest um, in graffiti that has led to my research and subsequently to the font. Um, it's been assumed that such marks as are found in graffiti, both ancient and modern, in their informal nature and the immediacy of the act of writing on a wall, for instance, have something in common. Whereas we would today view this as defacement of property, um, it, that re reveals far more about our modern expectations of behaviour than where writing should or should not have been found in the Roman world. So if we were to base this research on studies of contemporary graffiti, it's easy to view it as a form of usually illegal visual communication, um, largely considered antisocial behaviour. Although modern graffiti, so the defacement <coughs> that you see in bathroom stalls, for instance, is an illicit urban phenomenon that defaces other people's property. In the ancient Roman world, graffiti was a respected form of writing and often had an interactive element. Many gra recorded graffiti were found in in very public spaces, either daubed in paint as dipinto or graffito etched into brightly coloured walls. So the thing that we forget is plaster walls in the Roman times would have been highly and beautifully decorated. So by scratching into this paint to reveal the white plaster underneath, it becomes clear that the ancient graffiti is not only meant to be seen, but is often meant to be read. So graffiti in general is comprised of unofficial texts and images, and particularly concerns itself with the expression of thoughts and feelings of ordinary people. As such, the study of these ancient messages means that we, we are given a window into the daily life and interests and attitudes of the people who lived in the ancient world about whom most sources are silent because, as it says in the um, abstract, most sources were written by people with a, a bias, with people, by people with an interest in pushing a very homogenous, upper class male view of life in Rome and the Empire. So it's very interesting to be able to see these people creeping out of the annals of history because the value of literacy in the Roman world cannot be overstated. It was extremely powerful to be able to read and write, even at a basic level, um, in a society where a greater number of children did not learn to read Latin fluently than did. So 10 to 15 percent of the population were considered elite, which means that they were essentially learning to speak Latin from the equivalent sort of texts as if we were expecting primary school children to learn to read English by reading Shakespeare. If a Roman knew their alphabet and could write their own name and subsequently read, they would know for whom to cast a vote, they would know who was putting on um, 
gladiatorial or uh, bestial games, you know, who built statues dedicated to which gods, and they would know which emperor was issuing decrees. Plus, being literate made it possible to literally make your mark on your surroundings. Um, the wonderful thing about graffiti is you need neither money nor skill nor any reasonable level of literacy to engage with or create it. It's creation and consumption were really available to anyone with even a rudimentary proficiency in Latin at all to describe with and time enough to make marks. As a result, we can draw conclusions now about how everyday Romans talked, where they spent time, where they loitered, and their interactions, both singularly and collectively within these spaces, which makes them a valuable source for social, political, and cultural history, as long as we can place them in historical contexts and correlate them with other sources of information. Luckily, there are some graffiti where this is possible. However, exactly because of the non-monumental, private, spontaneous, and quite often anonymous nature, graffiti is often enigmatic. And as a result, their background, the background of the authors can be difficult to reconstruct. Graffiti typically only names the target of the text rather than revealing details about the author, which coupled with the lack of supporting evidence has previously led many archeologists to discredit graffiti as useful evidence, um, simply because we can't corroborate it with anything else. But the best thing about graffiti is a close look at particularly Pompeian graffiti shows that we really haven't changed much over time. Um, in how we interact with others and how we express ourselves to them. The very presence of graffiti and what we know of its ubiquity across the ancient world suggests that the potential audience for graffiti was much wider than that for, say, scrolls or book rolls. The brevity of the texts also means that it was far more accessible to the average person on the street. Um, the whole point of it was to get a, a point across really quickly and efficiently, which as anyone who's traveled to the continent knows, the Italians are fantastic at doing even today. So the walls of Pompeii seem to have been used for daily interactions, not just graffiti, but for sharing, um, as we'll, I'll show you later, when bread was made and it, or who was walking where, or how many, even in some instances, how many steps it took to take yourself from one spot to another over a period of um, journeys. And although this isn't useful if we're studying the vicissitudes of history, it does help us to understand how people have always communicated publicly about private things left spot uh, left comments or marks on spots that we've passed and displayed their personal connections and it's not just friendship and love but often anger or rivalry as well which proves that many graffiti not only commit communicate a message to a reader, but can also be viewed as being part of a dialogue with one another in the space in which they're found and the time during which they were made. There's some really interesting um, examples of 
graffiti being made in one place and then replicated across the city. So this particular view makes graffiti writing a relationship between a, a very tangled relationship between surface text or an image, the author and the audience. Obviously, the, as I've said previously, the wealth of formal written sources that we have, um, which were left to us by the Romans, suffer deeply from the socio-political biases they represent and the lack of diversity in their authorship. And it is one thing that you will notice as you study through the classics that the majority of authors were upper class males who weren't necessarily interested in sharing information about slaves or women or children. But this isn't so with graffiti. Although most graffiti is anonymous, we can gather information from where it was found within Pompeii, particularly, and by re analyzing references contained within um, texts, that almost every social group were represented in the creation and sharing of graffiti. Um, Funari wrote a very interesting uh, article attempting to demonstrate that certain graffiti was associated with certain social groups. So, for example, the prostitutes and clients at the Lupinari, rather than just assuming they were. And graffiti provides evidence of the ability to read and write at levels of society where you wouldn't necessarily expect literacy. Um, including slaves, gladiators, prostitutes, and builders. Our ability to reap the benefits of all this information, and I'll just swap. Um, so that you can see what the handwriting looks like. Our ability to reap the benefits of this um, wealth of knowledge is thanks to generations of archaeologists and Latin scholars, which began in 1857 with the Corpus Inscript Inscriptionum Latinarum and has been adopted and spread further by the work of Rebecca Benefield um, and the Ancient Graffiti Project. So contemporaneously, we're drawn to the study of graffiti thanks to the view it gives us of non-elite and marginal groups that early, earlier scholars scorned because we didn't have that much information about them. Today, we value graffiti because it adds nuance to our understanding of the periods which we're studying. So, there are two major branches of graffiti. There's folk epigraphy and lat latrinalia. So while folk epigraphy is a form of rite of passage messaging system, sorry, just letting people back in, um, a way to record movements and personal responses and relationships, latrinalia, which is graffiti quite often applied to washrooms and latrines, are largely more vulgar by contrast in their content. Um, quite often they take the form of limericks or rhymes, innuendo, slander or solicitation. 
although graffiti are meant to are intended to be read and often draw response from readers the anonymous nature of their authorship is curiously liberating and we see this echo today um, in online forums such as reddit or 4chan which allows users to assume a non-identifying username and thus enjoy this allure of anonymity so within the types of graffiti there are seven eight sorry <laughs> my fault um particular categories which are as follows so there's complementary um inscriptions love declarations slander and insults obscenities self-commemoration greetings messages quotes and actual evidence of Roman memes, which I adore and cannot wait to tell you about. So the images that follow are all taken from the corpus inscription and latinum, but written in the Amo Scribere font. The first category that we come to are complementary or love declarations. This type of graffiti has always been common because people want to shout love from the rooftops. Um, we have evidence from this from not just graffiti, but from writers such as Catullus, who literally turned love poetry into an art form. Um, Nowadays, we don't seem to get this type of graffiti as commonly as we used to because people use technology such as Facebook um, to make a record of their relationship status. But a subtype that you used to see is names, initials or hearts carved into bark of trees. And it, it's a curiously human thing that we've always wanted to record that we were here and that we were doing whatever we were doing with the people we love and i think that's what makes things like selfie culture so important because it's that ability to share the most human sides of ourselves, no matter what, where we are or what we're doing. So <laughs> I love, love the insults from Pompey. I, I, I struggled so much to narrow it down to two. Um, anonymous slanderous insults, uh, comments, it's a good way to vent your frustration and simultaneously warn others about unsavory behavior. However, Benefiel notes the graffiti that the Romans left was generally a lot kinder than the notes we see particularly online today. And she argues that that's due to the temporal nature of social media apps in that posts only gain traction and are shown to more people if they are in some way polarizing. Which obviously, if you're walking past some restaurant um, is another, the earliest known restaurant review, um, states that the innkeeper kept the unmixed wine for himself and served water. So, we've had Yelp since before 79 AD. Lewd or uh, just obscene comments. These again have become less common due to the rise of online dating apps. So whereas um, once upon a time you would have seen for a good time call this number, 
in washrooms or um, motorway services or transitory bathrooms, particularly in secluded rural areas, which people would, if they'd written, go back to to see if they'd had a response. Now we've got Tinder and Grinder, so that's taken over a lot of the more crude forms of graffiti that we get to see nowadays. We have no idea who Lucius was, but the fact that the judges who were presumably upper class Romans, well educated, proves that there are self-commemoration graffiti found among most groups. We found graffiti in the, again, the Lupinare, which is self-grandizing and among the most common types of graffiti at Pompeii are the self-commemorative. I think this particularly is the case because Pompeii was a port town. So you would have sailors dropping in and out and coming back and leaving who would want to leave evidence that they had been to Pompeii, who would want to leave evidence they'd been to anywhere um, within port areas. And the around 35%, 35-37% of the uncovered graffiti found so far from Pompeii are name tags, which supports this theory. And in fact, the oldest known graffiti at Pompeii happens to be Gaius was here. Or more precisely, Gaius Cumidius Diphilus was here, along with a timestamp, which was dated to October 3rd, 78 BCE, which I think is fabulous. Um, the, the evidence for self-commemoration is from slaves to the upper echelons. If anyone who could write wanted to write, I was here, I did this. Um, so unlike modern graffiti, which we typically think of as a youthful, um, almost like a youth, youthful delinquent um, phenomenon, there is considerable evidence to suggest that almost all groups would inscribe messages intending them to be read by others. Interestingly, the most underrepresented group are females, which suggests, but does not prove, that there may have been a gendered literacy gap. So, um, in particular, the graffiti to the right of the screen, Silamea, is of interest because this is one of the repeated styles of graffiti. So Emilius being reversed was one of four or five um, Pompeians who regularly graffitied across the city, who decided that in order to separate themselves from others, would write their name backwards. And we have this brilliant record from Sassonio of his friendship with a Pompeian we can identify from across different sites. And the um, Sadala Savete greeting 
Dolan's members was found on the Dolan pool of a bar. So that's further evidence that we have always wanted to be able to say, hi guys, that I particularly enjoy. Um, as for greetings in the modern day, um, my local pub, which is, it's brilliant timing, they've just installed blackboards in the bathrooms to discourage latrinalia from being scrolled on doors and walls. The most common message that we see on the blackboards is um, we love Kyla, hi Kyla, Kyla being the manager's girlfriend who's also the pub cleaner. So it's a lovely thing to know that as much as the Romans have always said, hi Emilius, I love you, we even in my little town in England, we still say, hi Kyla, we love you. And it's been brilliant, absolutely superb. While I've been writing this um, article to have evidence of that from the modern day. So I do apologize for the language on this slide, but we had to get somewhere, somewhere didn't we? Yes, Mouvete. As I've said before, graffiti expects it to be read. And as such, it's a really good way to impart general messages aimed at a lot of people. The interesting thing about the Mouvete graffiti is it was found on a column in the garden of the House of the Lovers, rather than outside the Lupinare, for instance, or outside the Forum, which makes it difficult to identify how active the literal meaning was. Um, obviously, bread is made on the 11th of the month, um, possibly refers to the corn dole. Um, so residents of Insulae would know when they could take their corn ration to have it made into bread. Um, another popular type of message that um, we see on the blackboards that are used in our local is random um, anonymous uplifting messages like you're gorgeous, you're wonderful, you can do this, all that kind of thing. So it's lovely to know that um, that sort of aspect of personal interaction has been maintained from, uh, from Pompeii. So the quotes of Arms of the Man I Sing, um, obviously famously the first line of Virgil's Aeneid, was a way to enforce social cohesion. So you could only interact with it if you knew the source, um, which creates an immediate link between the writer and the reader. There is a very famous misquote of the same um, line, I sing of fullers and an owl, not of arms and a man, which was found on the door jam of a laundress. So some, this way of misquoting um, texts in funny ways, a local ex modern example, um, again from the Bobbin in Lancaster was all men are cremated equal after a um, friend's, well, one of the barmaids um, unfortunately lost her dad. And that was one of the ones that we found after um, his funeral. But it's the, the right hand, oh, apologies, the right hand 
example, is found across Pompeii. That's a, a very commonly quoted and requoted um, comment. So someone must have made it popular and then obviously it went on to infect others, which leads nicely into the memes. So I think the most important of the memes on this page is for Lick to Pompeii. And that's because today memes are used as a way to cope with distressing or dreadful events by injecting black humour, which is a very human thing. Um, and although modern memes are primarily spread online now, the Felicita, uh, Felicta Pompeii being a repeated message and it being found um, obviously inscribed prior to the destructive eruption of Pompeii in, of uh, Vesuvius, sorry, in 79 AD suggests that by wishing the whole town well, they were trying to stave off the um, earthquakes that the city was prone to prior to the eruption. And I, I, I'm very, very interested um, to go back out to Pompeii when we can travel again and to see just how much this is the case uh, from where Felic to Pompeii can be found. Menedemarus, Menedemaruminos, sorry, that's a word enough, is a seemingly nonsense word, but it's, a test, it's attributed across Pompeii. A similar um, kind of reference was that some names were written in the shapes of boats, which could possibly have been uh, instituted by sailors visiting the port and then adopted by others. And as we saw on the previous slide as well, there was a fashion for writing names backwards. This proliferation and imitation is similar to the way that slang and um, dialects form within small groups such as Reddit forums. So that makes it really interesting to know that again, it's something that's been attributed throughout history and we're still doing it today, just in a different forum. So, Although the for, more formal write, style of writing was based on Roman square capitals, which is what you typically see on monuments, inscriptions, um, copied Roman books, as these texts needed to be instantly legible to anybody who accessed them. Old Roman cursive was the everyday form um, of handwriting used for writing letters, by merchants writing receipts and business accounts, school children learning the Latin alphabet. And it's this evidence of quicker, more informal writing that inspired um, not only my, my research, but the project, Amos Scriberi project. And we believe that Ro uh, cursive Roman handwriting is attested from the first century BCE to around the third century CE, um, but likely existed earlier than that. The wonderful thing that we've got is that graffiti has helped us to an gain an understanding of the lifestyles and languages of past cultures, particularly within Rome and the Roman Empire. We can see that 
obviously, as previously stated, women are highly underrepresented as writers, which might point to a different level of literacy um, between men and women. But there are also errors in spelling and grammar offered by these graffiti, which shows us the degree of literacy um, which was present in Roman times. So ancient graffiti of the Roman world has frequently been compared with modern examples. And we've assumed that such marks on modern and ancient walls alike have something in common. This phenomenon of graffiti writing in antiquity doesn't only make us reflect on modern practices, but also on our habits today of self-display in the modern world and on the connections between this self-display and wall writing and living in public, which is something that the Romans were very, very keen on. Um, so there's the information about the fonts, which I'll go into in a moment. But to bring our talk full circle, I couldn't help myself but to conclude with the world's most famous Latin graffiti in cursive font. Thank you for your attention. Hey, Rebecca, thank you so much for that. Um, that was really interesting and I'm going to open the floor immediately to questions if people have them. Um, so I can see a couple of hands going up. Or, um, there was one question that came through that I'm going to ask first. It came through in the chat box. Just specifically about the graffiti itself, whether or not it was it was painted graffiti. Um, it was wasn't carved. it? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just going through the, um, chat, the chat myself. <laughs> so that's that's the main one. Do we know anything about the paints that they used or if they used um, the paints more so or? I must admit that my field of interest is more in the graffito, the, the etched messages than the Dipinto, which is painted. Um, the Pinto was more for official, uh, like gladiatorial games being announced or political, um, candidates announcing that they were standing, etc. Um, the Hang on, yeah. yeah, so limericks, um, it is a more modern thing. The lim oh, I think you just went on to mute there. There you go, you're back, Rebecca. No worries. Um, limericks are more of a modern example of latrinalia um it was just covering sort of all of the um types that we see nowadays uh the greeting to members in a bathhouse yes to be honest um there are a lot of examples of greetings within bathhouses and really curiously um from patrons and brothels we've found quite a few different versions of for a good time you need to find this girl she charges x amount um so the romans have always the romans are as crude as we are the romans are as poetic as we are the romans are as bolshy as we are it's brilliant um to study it and find out just how common it is i think my favorite reference um particularly within uh the, the greek world is 
it's like reading Diogenes and finding out that you're doing something he railed against 2,000 years ago and having him throw a plucked chicken at you. I love um, that. Brilliant. <laughs> well, there are a lot more pictures that we obviously we can't identify as uh, male or female, but the it would be logical to assume that women would be more likely to communicate in pictures um, or symbols. So yeah, that's very very possible. Mentioned. Can, I, can I jump in there with Rachel's question? Because I was thinking along the same lines myself. Yeah. Um, how much, you know, were, were any of these kind of graffiti artists, were they, were they tracked down? Do we know if they were punished? You know, you mentioned about the antisocial behaviour at the start of your talk. Yeah. Equivalent in, in modern communities. Um, so do we know that people might have been, you know, punished for, for you know, if they were caught etching um, something into a column or into a, into a wall or into artistic decoration somewhere because it was so common um and it was actually, it was quite a respected form of writing and a way to share information there wasn't really any legal recourse so to speak um that we can find evidence but there is obviously the famous story of um Cicero being stabbed through the tongue by Mark Antony's aggrieved wife uh, for the quotes that he'd published, but obviously the um, mistake he made there was he published them under his name. Um, so yeah, walls being quite often decorated in some way and graffiti being etched into those walls. Um, the fact that we found as much graffiti in private homes as in public spaces suggests that there wasn't any sort of penalty for it. Um, we're aware, obviously, that Dipinto, as I've said, was largely communicating um, key local information, so gladiatorial games, statues being erected, religious ceremonies, political um, elections. But there's no evidence that I've found that graffiti was removed. Um, obviously, the, the amount we have that's extant today um, has largely suffered from the fact that plaster is it's such a delicate um, medium to write in. So the, the reason that um, Pompeii has so much graffiti is because in places it was buried up to like 24. So it preserved the walls, um, which helped to um, protect the plaster. What's actually caused more damage is excavating Pompeii because that brings the plaster to the front, uh, reveals it and leads to it, unfortunately, succumbing to the elements. The Alexamenos graffiti, I will just have to Google that because I must admit I'm not familiar with that particular one. Does anybody else in the meantime, while Rebecca's working on that, does anybody else have any questions that they want to ask? You can unmute yourself if you want to ask a, a quick question as well. Just maybe one or two more, Max, and we'll give Rebecca a break. We'll let her off the hook. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she's tired after giving such a wonderful presentation and everything. But we just might have time for one more. Um, from Chelsea, Monty Python aside, do you know to what extent we also see examples of graffiti in... Roman Syria or Roman Syria, Palestine? Um, most of the examples of graffiti, particularly among the 
boundaries of the Roman Empire are actually left by soldiers. They're left by the um, authorities. So it was a common thing to find, um, particularly around barracks and spaces like that. <laughs> the Aleximenos graffiti, sorry, I've just um, checked, is the um, potentially blasphemous um, image showing a young man worshipping a crucified donkey-headed figure. So what um, this possibly points to is the contentious issue of conflicting and competing religions within the, the Roman Empire um, at a time when there wasn't... It was enough of a... It was... Sorry, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. Um, yeah, so it, it's either it's been designed to depict Jesus, in which case it's blasphemous, or it's been designed to um, potentially mark out Aleximenos as the young man worshipping Christianity instead of the pagan gods. Um, so in that way, it, it proves that the idea of contentious religious practice within a space could quite often lead to um, direct slander, basically, um, direct attacks on fellow um, residents on and people who lived in the same space. So I'll just double check that there's no other questions. I think you've covered them all. I think I've just had a quick look myself there, Rebecca, and I just want to take this opportunity and I know I can see the thank yous coming in the chat box myself, just to thank you once again for your time, a wonderful presentation and what proved to be an, even more interesting than I initially thought it would be something really incredible, something I knew so little about. And now I feel I've really got an understanding of what, what the graffiti actually stood for. So I'd like to thank you once again. And I know Excellent. Um, other the, people are um, with me in that. So thank you so much. Thank you. The link for the font, if anyone's interested in purchasing it, is www.romancursivefont.com forward slash buy. I'll just type that in the chat. Perfect. That's even better. Pop it into chat if people are interested. Thank you once again from all of us here at Belfast Classics, Rebecca, for such a wonderful talk. So well done to you. And thank you very brilliant. much. Everyone. Guys, I hope to see you at the next talk um, by Dr. Charlie Kerrigan. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can email me. Um, Kerry Phelan, uh, not Helen McVeigh, but you can send me an email um, if you want any details about our next talk. But thank you so much to everyone and thank you for participating. So. Those of you at the Belfast Summer School will see you soon. And those of you who are coming to the next talk will see you uh, in a couple of days. Okay, thanks to everyone for attending.